Next week, I will continue the series through Luke where we're looking at the 12 apostles. Uh, as you know, we were going to look at the three that we could call terrorists. They were called zealots, and we will see them next week. Also, we have moved the communion service back one week, and so we'll celebrate communion next week. The reason for that is, as I looked at what I need to say, I need the whole period of time to say what I need to say this morning. Uh, this has been quite a week as the nation was stunned by a decision that I suspect most of us thought was forthcoming. And it deals with the Supreme Court of America as they made a decision that legalized gay marriage in all 50 of the states, overturning the state laws in many of those states. What I'd like to do this morning is really twofold. Number one, educational. I'd like for you to understand what the Bible really says about homosexuality. I won't do it in a condemning manner. I will just present it as God presents it. Because oftentimes you are drawn into conversations where people will say the Bible never speaks against homosexuality. Jesus never said anything. And it's only an Old Testament thing. All three of those statements are incorrect. And so the way to answer that is to show you what the Bible says. I'd also like to educate you regarding some of the potential ramifications, some of which have already started to take place, of this decision and what it means to you as a Christian, what it means to us as a church. And we'd like to not only educate, but also in the education talk about ramifications. The second thing, though, is education. And then number two, how should we as followers of Jesus Christ respond? And so I started looking for a verse that hits it really well, and I found it in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. If you look at the screen, you'll see this verse. Now let me read it slowly so you get your arms around it, because it tells us that we need to be prepared to give an answer, a thoughtful answer, a biblical answer, but it also tells us how we are to respond to people. And you're going to hear a couple of things from me. We will stand firm on the truth, but we will do it in a Christly manner. And here's what the verse says. Peter wrote it. He said, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And so as we look at how we respond, we learned something a couple of weeks ago from a group of African-American Christians in South Carolina. The world is still buzzing by their Christ-like response to a crisis. And so as we look at how we will respond personally and as a church, how will we respond? We'll look at that. Now I also understand this is an extremely emotionally charged issue. Many of us, maybe most of us, have family members, neighbors, co-workers, or friends that are homosexual. Having said that, oftentimes you don't know that they are, but they are. Some of you this morning may yourself be gay, or you are struggling with an attraction to members of the same gender. It wouldn't surprise me at all. In every church I've been at, I've had a number of people struggling with these issues. Some of you have fought a lifelong a battle against same-sex attraction. And you want to know if that's a sin. We'll talk about that. Some of you may be the parent or the grandparent of a child or a young adult who has come out as gay. And as one mom said, every time the preacher would get up and hammer on homosexuality, it was like having a dagger driven into my stomach because my son was there. And we will talk regarding that. Some of you in this audience believe that the Supreme Court made a right decision and that marriage, what's the big deal? Let's go ahead and legalize it. And I want to speak to that. I do know this. Those of us that are my age, if you get in a conversation with children, you are very likely to find that they don't agree with what you're saying. And it's led to many arguments, not necessarily in our family, but other people that when they bring it up to their kids, 
they find, even though their kids are believers, that they're not on the same page. So we need to address that potential. Uh, we also have students that if they go off to college and they say that they believe homosexuality is wrong and gay marriage is wrong, they will be branded as bigots. And increasingly, you're going to see even yourself being looked at as somebody who is bigoted because you don't approve of homosexual marriage. And that's happening already. So, I've got all of those caveats, and so I'm going to try to wade through this, and I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I will do it with gentleness and respect, but we do want to make sure that the truth is told. Is that fair? Let's go with it. Uh, I'm going to turn to 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 3, sort of to set the stage on this. We want to know what the Bible teaches, okay? It says this, mark this, there are terrible times, there will be terrible times in the last days. You ask, when are the last days? Welcome to today. And the last days are typically considered from the time Jesus left this earth to the time he will return. And so we've been living in the last days for about 2,000 years. However, the Bible says as those days approach, as we get closer and closer to the end, there will be things that start to really boil over. I believe we are in the last stages of the last days awaiting the return of Christ. And I believe what we're seeing with the Supreme Court is one of the indications that that's the case. It says here, in those last days, there will be terrible times. Uh, I don't think you have to let your mind wander to know that the times are getting terrible. More so. Verse 2, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. And then in verse 3 it goes on. It starts out and it says, without love, which I've underlined, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good. So in the last days, the last part of it, we will see those characteristics. One of those statements I preached through 2 Timothy, I dealt with that phrase, without love. Now, this demands that we look at the Greek, because that's a word that's only used twice in the New Testament, twice in the whole Bible. And it's astorgos, is a Greek word. You say, well, that really helped. If you were, to, some of you have very old translations, the original, or the old King James, and in the old King James, instead of saying without love, it says without natural affection. Now, that is the best statement. Because those of you that know a little bit of Greek, just enough to be dangerous, you'll know that the Greek has three words for love. There's eros, which is, we refer to that as erotic love. Phileo, which is like brotherly love, Philadelphia. And then there is this agape thing, which is this unsacrificial, or this sacrificial, unrequited love. None of those words are used there. And so when Peter wrote this, he threw in a word that was only used one other place in the New Testament, and it was used in Romans chapter 1 when Paul wrote about homosexuality without natural affection. That old scholar Warren Wearsby wrote about this word. He said, the phrase, it's really one word, without natural affection is the translation of one word that describes family love. In place of the natural love that God has put into men and women and families, today we have a good deal of unnatural love which God has condemned. Now, we saw the first shoe drop in 1973 when the Supreme Court determined that abortion would be legal in all 50 states. When we talk about natural love, what more natural love would there be by, uh, for a mom having love for her unborn child? And the fact that the nation, since 1973, has allowed in excess of 50 million babies to be aborted, 50 million shows that we have lost that natural affection for our babies in the womb. And so now we see what's happening with homosexuality. We are warned in the last days that they will turn from natural love. And in Romans chapter 1, that's the only other place this word is used, the author just hammers away at this unnatural form of love. So here's what I'm going to do. Let me give you some insights and observations. The Rick Cool insights. Number one, Christians must decide 
whose opinion is supreme. So I entitled this, The Supreme Court Decision Question Mark, with supreme in strange letters. The Supreme Court's responsibility is to determine what is constitutional. My job is to determine what is biblical. Biblical trumps constitutional. Okay, that's what you need to understand. Why are we tackling this issue? Why did the Supreme Court even tackle it? Now, there are those that say they never should have touched this issue. I'm going to stay out of all the constitutional law. But their job is to see if something is constitutional. Our job is to see if something is biblical. The Supreme Court has been wrong before. I could list all of the errors they have made. I want you to remember something. They are men and women just like you who put their clothes on every morning. The difference was they got a lifetime job. They are politically appointed. They were, everybody knew they were divided, four and four and one swing vote on this, depending on who appointed them to office. And they made a choice. Now, it is universally, they, they made bad choices before. None of you were alive in 1857 prior to the Civil War. There was a slave that had gained his freedom. His name was Dred Scott. He wanted to be treated like a human and to be considered a, a citizen. The Supreme Court of the land in 1857 ruled that he, because he was an African American, could never be considered fully human. Okay? That was the Supreme Court. And let me just read what some other chief justices have since said about that. For example, former Chief Justice C.E. Hughes called it the court's greatest self-inflicted wound. Bernard Schwartz says it stands first in any list of the worst Supreme Court decisions made. It took a war between the states, 500,000 deaths, and constitutional amendments to prove that that Supreme Court was wrong. I would say they are, were equally wrong in 1973 when they said that that life within the womb is only fetal matter and not a human life, and somebody can choose to abort or end that life. Now, remember, they are made up of political appointees. One author said the Supreme Court's decision turned on the swing vote of one political appointee. It was five to four, with incredibly strong opposition by the dissenting justices, including the Chief Justice of the United States. One of the things I did this week, you need to know, because it will impact this church, is I signed something called the Evangelical Declaration. You say, what is that? I will close the sermon and I'll read the last paragraph that was in it just before I signed. And when I looked around, leading Christian leaders of great stature throughout the nation have signed this. From our area in Southern California, the only two that I saw when I signed it, and there will be more, were David Jeremiah and Greg Laurie. I feel I am in great company with those two, okay? What we do is basically state that we believe the Bible trumps the Supreme Court decision, and no matter the cost, we will not marry gay couples in our churches, whatever that cost may be. And we'll talk about that potential cost. So you say, okay, so we believe the Bible trumps the Supreme Court's decision. Number two, so what does the Bible say? Now, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to read some stuff today. Rather than me giving the commentary on it, let, you, you're a reasonable person. You listen to this. And you ask yourself, does the Bible support or condemn homosexual relationships? So let me get started in Romans 1, verse 24. I won't read all of this, but I'll give you enough of it, and you can get the notes and read more later. Therefore, God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relationships for unnatural ones. 
It's interesting, it doesn't say, and the women exchanged. It says, even the women. And, and what it is saying is, if anybody should have natural relationships, it would be the women toward men. But he said, even the women have exchanged natural relationships with unnatural ones. Then it goes on and says, the same way, the men also abandoned natural relationships with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. And then it goes on and just hammers away at this. A reasonable person would not look at that and say, well, that's not really what it says. You know, the Bible is pretty clear on these issues and, and certainly on this issue. Uh, what I, I picked up a book that I really strongly recommend. It's by Kevin DeYoung, who is uh, the pastor of Uni University Reformed Church in East Lansing. He has written some incredible material. And he's got a, a small book, short book, you can read it in a day. And it's what the Bible really says about homosexuality. Kevin DeYoung, what the Bible says, really says about homosexuality. And he just goes through there and he answers the objections that are raised against Christians' views and presents what the Bible says. Here's one of his opening statements. Homosexual behavior is so repeatedly and clearly forbidden in Scripture that to encourage homosexuality calls into question the role of Scripture in the life of a denomination that accepts such blatantly unbiblical teaching. He will get so much flack for that because he's part of a denomination that is battling with this issue. And he said, to accept it is to accept unbiblical teaching. And then he starts listing some of the classic places. And he says, if you go to Genesis chapter 2, you'll see how God created us. He made a man for a woman and a woman for a man. That was God's design. And then it goes on, and people say, well, Jesus never taught it, what, that man and a woman together. Well, go to, go to Matthew 19. Well, what about Paul? Ephesians 5, where he says this relationship, one man and one woman, is symbolic of the relationship between Jesus Christ, the groom, and the church, who is the, the bride. Now, you don't have two brides. You don't have two grooms. Or two, it, it, it's a bride and a groom. And Paul lays this out so clearly in Ephesians chapter 5. And then if you go to the Old Testament, oh my, it, nobody argues against the Old Testament. Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, it just, no, no, no. Penalty, death, death, death. And I'm not advocating death, but that's what was presented in the Old Testament. And then Paul talks about how those that practice such things will not be allowed into God's kingdom. 1 Corinthians 6, and then his letter in 1 Timothy, starting with verse 1. And in Romans 1, I've already hammered at that, but he brings it up. And then he goes in, and DeYoung says, then there's Jude in that short little epistle. It links sexual immorality and the unnatural desires present in Sodom and Gomorrah. And of course, you know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and he, sort of, he sort of wraps this up with this statement. He said, at its root, support for homosexual behavior is not simply a different interpretation of Scripture. It is a rejection of the Word of God itself, period. You can't say you hold to the Word of God and hold to a view that says God did not condemn it in Scripture. All right, so... We, we've looked at what does the Bible say. We've agreed that the Bible will be our final source. All right, let me make things a, get a little squirming going on now. Number three, all sex outside of marriage is condemned by God. All sex outside of marriage. It's, it's okay in marriage. Don't get me wrong on this. That includes a guy and his girlfriend in the back of his dad's Buick. That includes a couple that's going to be married in three months and they're engaged, That's, they're still not married. That's sex outside of marriage. It includes all sex with somebody other than your partner, whether that individual is of the opposite gender or the same gender. There, God says there's only one thing that's righteous in his eyes. It means living together without, as we say, the benefit of the cloth, not having a wedding, without being married. The, the problem the church deals with at a much greater extreme 
is heterosexual sex as opposed to homosexual sex. And for every one gay guy or gal you have in your audience, you probably have 10 that are involved outside of the bonds of holy matrimony. Uh, I would interview couples that were getting ready to get married. Before I came here, I just had a whole burst of weddings I had to do back in Michigan. And, and I've done this long enough, and I've looked at the stats, and they say amongst, and hold on for this, amongst Christian couples that are getting married, 80% of them are sexually active before they get married. Okay? 80%. Now, so what the homosexuals are saying is, why aren't you condemning them? If you will not marry two guys because the Bible says no, why are you marrying a guy and a gal who are living together and sleeping together? Now, one of the things I do is I ask them, point blank, are you guys having sex? When I do the premarital counseling, oh, things get quiet in the room in a hurry then, you know? <laughs> and, and yet, you, you say, well, uh, you know, there's a lot of hemming and hawing, and, and my request is that they separate physically until the wedding. Right? Let's get you married, first of all, but let's abstain sexually until we're married. Now, one of the arguments that's given by proponents of gay marriage is uh, if, one, if one is homosexual, drawn to other men, that's not fair that they can never express their sexual desires to that person. If you're a Christian, the Bible says you can't have relationships with another man and you're not attracted to women, that's not fair because I have to live with these strong desires. And the implication is their desires are stronger than the heterosexual's desire. Let me explain what I mean. We, I believe that we all have to deal with desire sexually. John Piper wrote, the human heart is a ceaseless factory of sensual desires. And just because you're married doesn't mean you don't have sexual desires that are outside of that marriage. And you, husband or wife, you need to obey God's word. You need to obey God's word. And, and also let me add this, there are many women who also have desires for men, but nobody's ever asked them to get married. And that homosexual is discounting all of the tensions that are there. Mervyn Vincent sort of wraps up this, this is all I'll do with this third topic, and he talks about God's view of all of us. Now I'm going to call you a sexual deviant in a moment, okay? Or Herman will or what is it, Merville Vincent will. Here's what he said, listen carefully. And by the way, I'm quoting him. In God's view, I suspect, we are all sexual deviants. I doubt if there is anyone who has not had a lustful thought that deviated from God's perfect idea of sexuality. Now, I could ask for a show of hands, I won't do that. See, and you say, well, I didn't follow through. Yeah, but what did Jesus say? You say you have not committed adultery, but you've lusted in your heart. You're just as guilty. And so in God's view, we have, we have some apologizing to do. Number four, there is a debate as to whether or not homosexuals are born that way, nature, or they are sort of persuaded to go that way, nurture. The old nature versus nurture. Now, I'm not going to tell you which way I lean. Because I've leaned one way, I've leaned the other, and I keep going back and forth. Here's the bottom line. Whether a person is born genetically ready to be gay, or whether they are persuaded later to be gay because of an association or whatever, it's still wrong for them to follow through in a sexual way. They may be attracted to members of the same gender, but to have sex with them violates God's word. Now, I, I've read some stuff. Tim Hay had a book, The Unhappy Gays, and I remember reading it years ago, and he talked about how to spot who is most likely to be gay. 
And one of the things he had stated is almost all of them have melancholy temperaments. They typically are into the arts. Often they have a detached father in their home. And he said, so even though the majority of, of gays are melancholy, the vast majority of melancholies are not gay. And so he said, you know, this is something that's going on. And he's trying to pin down whether they are made that way or whether they're born that way. I read some stuff by Dr. Chuck Wood this last couple weeks, and and here's what he says. He said, when signing three bills, Governor Jerry Brown dismissed sexual orientation modification, in other words, bringing a person out of their homosexuality. Our governor called it quackery. Uh, Now, to be fair with the Republicans, Governor Chris Christie said that people are born gay, and both of these statements ignore according to Dr. Wood, empirical evidence that, for many teenagers, sexual orientation is unstable and changeable. And then he cites some studies. He said the most comprehensive study of sexuality to date, the 1992 National Health and Social Life Survey, found that without any intervention whatsoever, three out of four boys who think they are gay at age 16 don't think they're gay by age 25. And so there's this this changeability going on. And so one of the questions now will be, if in fact individuals are influenced by the legalization and and somewhat the official go get them to the homosexuals, whether that will increase the prevalence of it. Well, let's go to point number five. And, And by the way, I don't know whether they're there by nature or by nurture. Nature or nurture, it's probably a little of both, and and I'll just leave it at that. Now, I'm going to talk about same gender attraction and state there's a difference between same gender attraction and being gay. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, our, our nation's big center that works on various things, in 2007 did a report on adolescent health in the United States. And the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention surveyed 10,000 teenagers and found that the vast majority of 16-year-olds who reported only same-sex attractions reported only opposite-sex attractions one year later. And so you say, what is that all about? It says, because these surveys produce such unexpected results where the kids seem to be attracted guy for guy and the next year they change their mind and they're all over the place, produce such unexpected results, they did similar studies were soon replicated in the Western world. The outcomes were almost identical with population-based samples now reaching into the hundreds of thousands. Now, one of the questions I'm asked is if a young guy or a young gal comes in and the guy says, I feel attracted to other guys, what'll I do? Well, we know you can't have sex with them, okay? They say, well, does that mean I have to be celibate all my life? Well, if that's what it takes, yes, yes. You say, you know, some may say that's not fair. Others, I continue to read books by Christian authors and leaders who have same-sex attraction and have chosen to never marry and are now speaking to the gay community about those with same-sex attraction. We acknowledge it's there. We acknowledge that it is not sin to have that attraction because those of us that are heterosexual, we're attracted to members of the opposite sex that God has said nothing should take place with. And so the same-sex attraction we, I, I'm on a college board, and, and we deal with students who, if they are practicing homosexuals, they'll not be admitted to the college. If they confess to the admissions officer that they struggle with same-sex attraction, they will, okay? Because most of the other students are grappling with other sex attraction. Neither one of them can follow through unless they are bound together, husband and wife. So, the yielding is the sin. Number six, this issue will not go away for the local church. My friends, it has just begun. It has just begun. I was playing golf a while back with 
Jim Smith. Jim was the interim pastor here and is the president of the Pacific Church Network that we belong to. And, and so I never carry my telephone when I golf. Why? Because I might get a phone call. And my golf game is tough enough without getting interrupted by one of you. No. <laughs> if it's really important, my wife knows where I'm at and they can hunt me down. But Jim carries his phone. And so I remember walking up the 8th fairway, and he gets a call, and he said, I need to deal with it. Well, he started dealing with it. They've got a church. It's a pastor calling. They've got somebody uh, new to the church. He's a guy, and uh, he's a homosexual, uh, but he does not engage in homosexual activity. He's chaste. He never has, but he'd like to work in the nursery. Okay. So <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what we did with that. But there were, there were four of us, all pastors, and, and we all had our say before we got off the next tee box. And it's tough. You say, okay, why shouldn't he? Or others of you would say, what are you, crazy? You know, and, and so there are all different issues that we're going to have to deal with. We need to respond in a Christ-like manner. I know that. That's a given. We have got to respond in a Christ-like manner. We have to make sure that your pastor does not make jokes about gay people. Can't do that. Now, uh, I have been guilty of mocking gay people I knew in the past. I have apologized for that. And most of you that are men, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes the women would say, well, you guys probably weren't that hard on them. Oh, you have no idea how tough guys can be. And um, can't do that. And the other thing in the church is we cannot only focus on that sin, we can't ignore heterosexual sin, okay? Because one of the things they're going to say is, why is this being focused on when you have 10 other people living together that aren't married? Okay, what's, what's going on there? All right, and our kids, by the way, see the inconsistency, and the world will see it. Number seven, the Supreme Court decision will have a profound impact on our country. I love the great singing we had. I listened last night to the uh, Macy's 4th of July celebration, and it was spectacular. And I listened to the songs, God Bless America. I listened to the Pledge of Allegiance, One Nation, Under God. And I just heard God sprinkled all of America, America, God shed his grace on you. You need to know I'm an exceptionalist, an American exceptionalist. I believe that God put, when I do a prophecy sermon, you will know where I stand on this. I believe America is here for a specific prophetic purpose and that God has used this as the engine of worldwide missionary evangelism and a safe haven for his Jewish people as he prepares to bring them back into the land and a place where my grandparents could leave the country of their birth and come to a place where they had greater religious freedom. I believe in that. I also wonder how God listens to us singing God Bless America, knowing what just happened when God's laws for marriage were turned over by this country. Well, the Supreme Court decision will have profound American uh, impact on America, first of all, as it relates to God's blessings and protections. This is the first time, I don't think I'm wrong on this, that we have publicly endorsed what God calls sin, God clearly calls sin, publicly endorsed it, but also celebrated it. It was like a party. And as we went to the house of the commander-in-chief, we saw not red, white, and blue, but we saw a rainbow highlighting the White House. That bothers me, and I know I'm not alone on that, right? I'm saying, what was he thinking? It'll have an impact on God's blessing on us. John MacArthur sent a letter out to the master's men, which are groups of pastors. And here's what John said. The word of God has pronounced judgment on any nation that would reclassify evil as good and reclassify darkness and light and bitter as sweet, Isaiah 5.20. He goes on, as a nation, America continues to put herself in the crosshairs of judgment. 
as a proclaimer of truth, talking to the pastors, you are responsible for never compromising on these issues. In every way, you must stand firm. No human court has the authority to redefine marriage, and the verdict yesterday does not change the God-ordained reality of marriage. I agree with them. Now, secondly, the impact it will have on America as it relates to the definition of marriage. Joel Rosenberg, many of you have read his books, and just a fabulous writer, a Christian Jew. The court's ruling forces 320 million Americans to embrace overnight a radical re-engineering of the entire social compact of marriage that even some of the nation's most liberal political leaders strongly opposed just a few years ago. He goes on, for more than 5,000 years, Judeo-Christian civilization has been built on the definition of marriage as one man and one woman in a sacred compact before God, creating a family that can bear children and raise them with the loving care of a father and a mother. Now, five unelected justices of the court are undermining the fundamental building block of a healthy, stable Western civilization with no idea what the downstream implications and ramifications will be. I could speak on that. I believe they have just, they have just boxed themselves into a horrible corner. And the next challenges are going to really stun the nation. He goes on, until recently, even some of America's most liberal political leaders were opposed to this radical social experiment. Uh, let me quote a senator back in 2008. He was being uh, interviewed on MTV. He's, by the way, president of the United States, now Senator Barack Obama at the time. Quote, I believe marriage is between a man and a woman. I am not in favor of gay marriage, end of quote. Huh. Hillary Clinton, you may have heard of her, in 1999, she was explaining why she supported the Federal Defense of Marriage Act with a one-man, one-woman definition of marriage that was signed into a law by her husband, the President Bill Clinton, and I'm quoting Mrs. Clinton now, marriage has historic, religious, and moral content that goes back to the beginning of time, and I think a marriage is as a marriage has always been between a man and a woman, in quote. Should she continue in her bid for the presidency, it'll be interesting to see how she caters to the gay lobby when she is quoting that. Seems like she's changed her mind. Uh, here's a second thing, how it impacts our country. As it relates to the role of the Bible in American churches, all right, this is where it's gut check time. Pastors, are the pastors going to proclaim the word of God even though there are political consequences? Even though there may be cost consequences? Even though they may be called bigots? It's gut check time. Are the pastors who say they believe in the Bible really going to believe in all of the Bible? Or will they say, well, that was culturally different back then when all of that was written, or that was just a moral example, or God may have changed his mind, or that part of the Bible is in doubt. All of these things are incorrect. I mean, it is clear. And now I think there will be a discerning of which churches really are prepared to take a biblical stance. And I think we will see that coming real soon. There is a battle for the Bible raging now, similar to one that has gone in the past, where there are evangelical groups that are backing away for the full, from the full authority of Scripture. You just need to know as this church, we have one Supreme Court, it is God's Word. That's it. That's it. And if I ever drift from it, you need to fire me. Quote Donald Trump, you're fired. You know, it's, although I think NBC just did that to him too, didn't they? But let me stay away from that one. I don't, I don't want to touch that one. I can go after the Supreme Court, but not the Donald, okay? <laughs> All right, so here's a fourth thing, as it relates to our religious freedoms. The Constitution guarantees us the right to practice religion as we want, without government influence. David Crawford tried to look ahead, and he said, they have sort of offered us some condolences on this, 
But he said, let me show you where this is going. He said, the tolerance that is really being offered is provisional and contingent. It's tailored to accommodate what they believe as a significant but shrinking segment of society that holds a publicly unacceptable private bigotry. In other words, we are privately bigoted if we hold that marriage is only to be between a man and a woman and that it's a small and dying part of our American society. Here's what he says going on. Where over time it emerges that this so-called bigotry has not in fact disappeared, more aggressive measures will be needed, which will include explicit legal and educational components as well as simple ostracism. When I look ahead, and if you were to ask me, from my experience sitting on nonprofit boards, watching what's going on, government meddling in, in areas. By the way, tomorrow, your state legislature will be voting on Bill 7, AB, AB, Assembly Bill 755, which says that one of the mission agencies we support, which is the Fallbrook Pregnancy Center, will have to post very visible signs for all of the gals that are coming in and being counseled about and holding on to their babies, that there is a way to get an abortion, here's where it's located, they will provide all of the resources for the abortion, and everywhere they turn in the clinic, wherever they're going to see these signs, that the, the, the groups that are promoting life will be forced to put those signs in. They're going to be voting, your representatives, and with the makeup of the assembly, it will pass. It'll then go to the governor, and it will be signed into law. And so pray that God, God does something on this. God's will be done. But I believe when it comes to the issue of gay marriage, it will impact our tax codes, and especially it'll go after parachurch organizations like the Christian University, who's already got a suit against the United States going to the Supreme Court. Okay, it's already, go, it's already in the works. And it deals with being forced to provide health care that provides for abortion-inducing drugs to their employees. And we as a university said, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that because this is murder in our eyes. And now when you throw the whole thing with same-sex marriage, we, I mean, we're being hit with Title IX, which says that you have to provide equal opportunity for guys and gals. All right? We've done that. But now they have rewritten that, and it says you have to provide equal opportunities for guys, gals, and then it lists all the other potential mixtures. And we have to do that. And, and, and it goes on and on. And what will happen is... Our colleges will be looked at as being in violation of human rights, human civil rights. And they will very likely say you can continue to operate, and by the way, that includes uh, Master's College, uh, San Diego Christian, it includes Biola, it includes all the other schools, that if you persist in the way you're going to do this, even though the schools brag about we don't take any federal money, <laughs> little known secret, all of the kids that are coming there have federal grants, scholarships, or loans. And kids, you can go to any college you want except for those that discriminate, i.e. the Christian schools. And what will happen is that source of funds will absolutely dry up. The other pressure you're going to see is on the accrediting agencies. If you wanted to go and work and, and graduate from an accredited college, that means a lot. But I, I suspect that the cre accrediting agencies, which are non-Christian, will be forced to drop those schools that violate, as they would say, civil rights. This is all coming. And the other thing is, because we are in violation, that $100 million campus, you need to start paying property taxes on it. Ouch. And by the way, the day is coming when our churches will end up paying property taxes. And this will be a sobering experience. Uh, so we'll see taxes used to pressure churches and parachurch organizations. You say, you sound like a prophet of gloom. You ought to read some of the other stuff I read. I mean, I'm, I'm an optimist, basically. But let me read Matt, Matt Walsh. All right. He says, 
bloggers can get away with anything. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever read bloggers, but uh, they can change their mind in the middle of a sentence. He said the first step of attack is the church. There are already calls to take away their tax-exempt status as they oppose gay marriage. Notice when this happens, and it will happen, they will only revoke it to the churches, not Planned Parenthood and uh, other places. Next, he said, they'll attack the churches legally. Remember, liberals tell us gay marriage is a human right, something akin to the right to be free from slavery. To oppose it is to essentially support the dehumanization of gay people, but churches would surely not be permitted to keep slaves, nor would they do anything else to infringe on human rights. Therefore, if gay marriage is in that category, then the argument is already in place to legally prohibit churches from denying unions to gays. People say, well, that can't happen. Well, you know, I think they've already done that to a florist, a baker, photographers, and t-shirt making companies. And as Walsh says, what's the difference between them and a church? And they shut these people down because they wouldn't do things that were against their religious beliefs. Now, he continues, and he goes into the last one. And he starts out and he says, as different groups of fetishes enjoy their own time in the sun, you will see the institution of marriage reduced to utter nothingness. Next on the agenda, bigamy and polygamy. He said, There's no way, the, the Supreme Court has painted themselves into a corner where they said, well, if that's how a person feels, whatever our old definition of marriage was, they have strong feelings, man toward man, woman toward woman. You're going to hear somebody coming in and saying, I have strong feelings, man toward woman, woman, woman. Or you're going to get all kinds of stuff. And they talk about incest, uh, children, and, and all of these are going to be brought to the Supreme Court. And I think the first one that will be brought in will be polygamy or bigamy. We'll wait and see on that. Uh, another thing that's happening under this category is the labeling as bigots, all those who disagree with same-sex marriage. Now, I don't know about you, but when you're in polite conversation, this is not an easy topic to bring up because they tend to look at you as one of those guys from back in the hills, you know, who's living in the 1900s and, and that you're, maybe you're motivated by hate. And, and, and so you're hearing the word bigot, bigot being thrown in. All right, so hold on to that. Now let's change the tone a little bit. You're going out of here saying, man, we're ruined, you know. My life is ruined. Number eight, God doesn't need the Supreme Court to accomplish his purposes. Because most of the Christians that have lived in this world have had opposition from their government. We have lived in a very special time. Jesus said in John 16, 33, he said, I have told you these things about suffering and all of that, so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. In this, Jesus is leaving, he said, I need to tell you. In this world, you, you better man up because you're going to have trouble. But he says, take heart. I have already overcome the world. I have already overcome the world. I gave some stats on fastest growing areas for Christianity. I read an updated one and I got the, the top ten of where Christianity is growing the fastest in this world. And no, there's not a single Christian country on it. Number one, Nepal, which is Buddhist. China, which is anti-religion and just keeps exploding. They, they say there are probably more Christians in China than there are in America, about 150 million, where it is under attack from the government. Uh, the United Arab Emirates is number three. It's Muslim, Saudi Arabia, Muslim, Qatar, Muslim, Oman, Muslim, Yemen, Muslim, Mongolia and Cambodia, Buddhist, and finally Bahrain, which is Muslim. So what I'm saying is, Jesus said, don't worry, you're going to face trouble. And all of these are countries where you could die for your faith. We, we might just be called bigots and lose tax advantages, but God said, but don't worry, Jesus said, I have overcome the world. He has already gotten victory. We're just what he, He's got the title deed to this world in his hand. It's paid in full on the cross. 
He is just waiting to come and take possession. That's all he's waiting for. And at the right time, he'll come. So, as I close, and I do need to close, what are we to do? All right, you're ready for some other people speaking? Number one, Tim Wilkins is a, a former practicing homosexuality. He is the founder of Cross Ministries, which is dedicated to helping churches like ours reach out and save the souls of homosexuals. As a man who has come out of a deep, dark homosexual history, he said, here are the things you need to do. Number one, acknowledge our failure to reach lost homosexuals. The president of Southern Seminary, Albert Moeller, so highly respected. Here's what Moeller said. Evangelical Christians must ask ourselves some very hard questions. But the hardest may be this. Why is it that we have been so ineffective in reaching persons trapped in this particular pattern of sin? Great question. See, the church is a place for broken people. And I'm going to tell you, there's nobody hurting more than a homosexual. We hear about the very loud, radical, politically motivated homosexuals. But my friends, the vast majority are hurting. They're hurting. The second thing is understand that homosexuals are in our churches and in our families. Dr. Chuck Wood wrote, a man, this is a pastor in his 80s, you may ask, where must I go again to gain an audience with a homosexual? The truth is you are presently preaching to homosexuals. They're among your visitors and yes, your members. Some constitute your choir, your elders, your deacons. They are men and women, married and single, teenagers and senior adults. Overwhelmingly, they are inconspicuous, but you should know that they are there. Albert Moeller said the tragic fact is that in every congregation is almost certain to include persons struggling with homosexual desires or same-sex attractions or even involved in it. Number three, understand the pain being suffered. Again, we hear about those that are belligerently on a political agenda. And by the way, this is not over for them. This is just the start of what they want. But the vast majority are not even seeking gay marriage. They're just, and many of them because they don't want to give up their wild lifestyle. But others that are just hurting. Wood goes on to say, though some are satisfied with their homosexuality, the vast majority are not. This majority does not live a gay lifestyle. They do not march in gay parades or fight for social rights. They hurt. They hurt deeply. They want freedom from same-sex attractions, and they want to hear a word from you that goes beyond condemnation. I cannot be, and by the way, if you think this is a young radical, the man's 82 years old. He's been a Baptist preacher for 60 years. I cannot begin to tell you the number of parents who hear our heated remarks on homosexuality and suffer silently with a son or a daughter who's caught in the trap. One such mother told me that hearing her pastor's imprudent remarks felt like being jabbed in the stomach with a butcher knife. Number four, Wilkins, former homosexual. He said, you have to realize that the Great Commission applies to homosexualities. And in, to summarize what he said, when we go to them, we don't preach another gospel. We don't go to them, instead of saying, go and make disciples, we don't go and say, go and make heterosexuals. That's not the gospel we present. It has to be the same gospel. We don't try to convert them from their homosexuality, then to Christ. We need to bring them to Christ and let Christ inside out transform their lives. Number five, accept the first rule to evangelizing homosexuality is to love them. Joe Dallas says, often people ask, how do you witness to a gay? The question itself shows misunderstanding. Why should witnessing to gays be any different from witnessing to anyone else? Their homosexuality is not our main concern. The state, state of their everlasting soul is our first concern. Albert Moeller goes on, outside the walls of the church, homosexuals are waiting to see if the Christian church has anything more to say about after we declare that homosexuality is a sin. He said, we must love homosexual, homosexuals more than they love their homosexuality. Now this is where it gets tough, isn't it? This is tough. But this is, it's the love of Christ that does it. The old Episcopal preacher, Philip Brooks, said, the next element of a preacher's power 
The next element of a preacher's power is genuine respect for people whom he preaches to. If you speak to the homosexual with contempt, disgust, or hatred, you will not reach them for the Lord. Wiersbe says lost sinners came to Jesus not because he catered to them or compromised his message, but because he cared for them. And as we look forward, we're not going to cater to anybody's sin. And we're not going to compromise what we believe. But we will care for the sinners. Because, you know, I'm your pastor and I've got a whole room full of sinners. It's just different sins we're dealing with. And this one is, people ask, is it a special sin? It is. Homosexuality is. And God does address it in a special way because the sacredness of the marriage as presented initially with Adam and Eve and the fact that it is representative of the relationship between Jesus Christ, the groom, and the followers of Christ as the bride puts it in a whole different category. But having said that, your sin is just as repugnant in God's eyes. What do we need to do? Let me just, one more quote and I'm done. Our response, Joe Dallas says, should show interest and concerns, two qualities the church has rarely shown when dealing with homosexuality. We must admit we have mishandled the issue in many ways. We have veered between ignoring the problem or becoming obsessed with the problem. We have made hasty and false generalizations at times with homosexuals themselves. And we have shown a tremendous zeal for defeating the political goals of gays while showing less concern and zeal for their eternal well-being. Well, moving forward, I'm almost done. I wanted to do this. I, somebody said you can't. I had somebody really editing this, vetting it. I ran it by a number of guys because I know the notes will end up getting published. And, and I want to make sure I get it right. And as I looked at this, I said, you know, I, I still, the goal is to be uncompromising and biblically founded. That is us as a church. That's where we've got to be. But we need to be the church that will love all the sinners of this community. We are in the middle of a community filled with sinners, such as us. The only difference, we're sinners that are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. And by the way, if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you're dealing with any of these problems, I'm happy to talk with you about any of these problems. I've talked with many others before. But I'm also going to tell you that your number one need is Jesus Christ. And my prayer is that you'll come and talk to me and I can share Christ with you. Well, so we need to take a stand and we need to be loving. I, I signed, as I said, the, the evangelical declaration and because I put our church down as my church, we are now on record. So you ready for that? You, are you okay being on record on this? I, amen. I, I know this church and I know where they stand. And I didn't even talk to the elders. If they fought me on this, I'd have fired the elders. <laughs> They're, oh, Brad's going, what? what, what? No, they are, they are on board, and I know that. I know their hearts. You've got good, good men. And so I had the freedom to sign this. And here's what the last paragraph says. And then, praise team, come on up here, and let's sing a song that will remind us of our special godly heritage that we have. The gospel, it, quoting, the gospel of Jesus Christ determines the shape and tone of our ministry. All the pastors that signed this and the college presidents and so forth, they're saying this. Christian theology considers its teaching about marriage both timeless and unchanging, and therefore we must stand firm in this belief. Outrage and panic are not the responses of those confident in the promises of a reigning Jesus Christ. While we believe the Supreme Court has erred in its ruling, we pledge to stand steadfastly, faithfully witnessing to the biblical teaching that marriage is the chief cornerstone of society designed to unite men, women, and children. We promise to pro proclaim and live this truth at all costs with convictions that are communicated with kindness and love. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I pray that your word might have been clearly communicated so that we leave here with understanding of both what you have said and what the potential ramifications are going to be. But also, Father, we've got a clear understanding of how then shall we respond. 
And we've committed ourselves to knowing the facts, knowing what you said, but also as Peter instructed us, that we should do this with gentleness and respect. And Father, for those that are here this morning that are grappling with these issues, whether it's a parent that has a child struggling with it or a grandchild or somebody that's struggling with these issues themselves, I pray, Father, that they might see my heart and my heart is to love them and to love them more than they love their homosexuality. And I pray, Father, that as we see turmoil in our world and we hear of all the uncertainties, you have said, Jesus said, you will have trouble. But he said, but don't worry. I have overcome the world. We stand on that pledge in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please stand with us.